All right, welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Renee Bourgeois. I think most of you know me. I'm from the John Humphrey Center here up in Amiskwichi, Waskahagan, and uh, Treaty 6 territory, or otherwise known as Edmonton. Uh, together to, today, I'm like super excited to have this session. It's like 104 advocacy strategies, and I've got my an old and good friend Roxanne Ulinicki, who's a disability rights advocate, who will be um, taking us through all of her learnings over the last many years. Um, I'm not going to like talk too long. I just want to acknowledge a couple things. One, um, yes, we are up here in Treaty 6 territory, and I think what's just most important about that when we acknowledge treaty is just recognizing, you know, the relationship of the treaty, but also just for recognizing that the oppression um, that was built upon those treaties just continues today. Um, you know, our colonial history of genocide and, and that is, is deeply embedded. And I think that's why we're all here doing this kind of work is to kind of push back against um, the oppressions that exist in our communities. So thanks for joining us today. Um, and this is like the fourth in uh, a series of sessions we're doing around human rights advocacy um, for our STRIDE program. And STRIDE is a program really to build a network of advocates across the province. Um, but we've been having some people since COVID joining us even from Ontario and beyond, which was beautiful. Um, and really be a space where we can learn and strengthen our capacity, but also to do the work together and build relations. So. I know it's kind of interesting to build relations in the midst of uh, us all in our Zoom stalls, but hopefully we can see each other in the flesh sometime soon. <laughs> um, so with that, um, yeah, I just like jump right into things and evolve forward, but uh, here we're up in Amiskwichi, Um So with that, and <laughs> See, I always get ahead of myself. I have slides for a reason and I just get ahead of myself all the time. But um, this is just kind of tells you a little bit more about uh, Stride Advocates and who we are and welcome all of you on here who are part of that program. Um, and just want to acknowledge the support. The Edmonton Community Foundation has really been the supporter that's really allowed us to build this effort over the last number of years. And um, this year, we've also been able to get some support from the Government of Canada and the Government of Alberta to kind of help us build forward, at least till the end of March 2021. <laughs> so um, we'll keep it moving from there. So with that said, uh, Rox, I'm going to pass the mic over to, to you. Cool. I'm just got to get myself sorted here. Hey, everyone. My, as Renee said, my name's Roxanne. Um, and just to give you a really quick um, history of my work is that I am, I grew up with my disability and um, our system back then, I don't know about today, but treated children with disabilities really well. And I had access to everything I needed and uh, entered adulthood thinking I was gonna take on the world. And which I did a little, I, I'm a former Paralympian. I competed in the 1988 Paralympics in Seoul, Korea. For wheelchair basketball um, but then entering adulthood in in Alberta with a disability has been extremely difficult um, so along the way I had to strongly advocate for myself and at one point I just decided well if I have to do this much work just for me why don't I just do this for everyone why don't I make this an us rather than a me um, and so I created a clinic for adults with spina bifida in Edmonton, and it was the first in North America. Um, it could be a lot better than it is, but it took me um, four or five years of writing letters and advocating to do that. So I'm just going to go through some of the, gen you know, some of the points that are really important when you're doing this kind of work um, in order to make your case because that's really what this is about, is making your case. Um, so starting with the general rules, um, the first one is record everything, everything, dates, names, times. You know, you left a message, you spoke to somebody, what did they say? Um, you should just have a little notebook dedicated to this project and you just make notes every time you speak to somebody, every time you leave a message. Um, every time you email, although again, you could have an email folder full of those kind of requests. 
Um, and it's really important. And as a young person, this was a big learning curve for me at times when you're very frustrated. It's important to realize to not attack, to attack the issue and not the person. That it's nobody's fault that our system sucks. Um, most people are very well intentioned and really want to help you. Um, and it's mostly the systemic issues that are the problem. So it's important to remind yourself of that. And sometimes even when you're attacking the issue, the individual may feel attacked. Um, and so it's, it's important to realize what language you're using. And it's important to realize that people, some people are just going to take it personally, even though you don't intend it to be. And that's just part of the game. Um, the other general rule is to know what you want. What are you asking for? Um, what do you want to see as a remedy? And so these are, and we'll have slides a little bit later, but it's really important to kind of set up, you know, who am I asking? Who can help me? All of those sorts of things. Um, and so just the, and these are just the general rules, right? And so next is to do your research. So it's to really know what can you ask for? I mean, you can ask for an, you know, a huge systemic change, but the likelihood that you will make that happen is highly unlikely. So, you know, I had a, a friend years ago, um, a woman with a disability who was kind enough to mentor me for a number of years. She was a communications professor at the U of A. And she would say, when you're asking for beds and they give you bedpans, you take the bedpans. <laughs> So just saying that you have to be prepared to take less than what you're asking for and to really think about that when you're making that ask. Mm -hmm. Maybe ask for a little more so you have a bit of room to, to come down a notch or two. Okay. And, there, and the next point is there are many ways to do self-advocacy and it is very true. Like there's a million different ways you can go about it. Um, so you really have to think about the industry that you're working, you know, you're asking for for change in and all of that. And the other thing that I know is sometimes hard, but you can only count on yourself. You can never count on anyone else to do anything, even if they say they will. And I don't mean that as a slight to anyone. It's just, you have to follow up constantly. If somebody says, oh, I'll do that, then you need to call them in a week. And then you need to call them in another week. And you, know, you have to keep following up always. Um, and it's sort of a, a matter of lowering your expectations. You know, we're all very busy. We all have a million things we're doing in life and sometimes things get lost and, and not attended to. Um, and so it's not to take it personally. It's just always to stay on top of everything that you want to achieve and don't expect anyone else to do it for you. Um, yeah, there we go. Those are the general rules. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna dive into a step-by-step -step process and we'll walk you through. Okay, so we're gonna get specific. <laughs> yes, we are. So the first thing when you're, you're looking at an issue is to identify the issue. And so, and I'll use the clinic that I got started just as an example along the way. Um, so initially, the, the issue that I was dealing with is that adults with um, specific disabilities don't have access to specialized care after the age of 18. So that's the issue is where does somebody with a disability go for assistance um, after the age of 18? And, and really right now, it's, it's still today, you're supposed to go to a family doctor who literally knows nothing about disability or your specific disability. So then you have to spend months, if not years, teaching your doctor how to treat you, which seems a little counterintuitive. Um, so you identify the issues and then you want to think about, well, who else has this issue? So for myself, I knew there was an entire population of people with spina bifida that had the same issue as me. Um, and what is needed to resolve the issue? Um, so for us, we needed a clinic. We needed a place to go where we could see doctors who specialized in the care that we required. Um, and then it's, of course, to be specific. Mm -hmm. But the point, the one point I want to make about, are there others with this issue? How do you find those people, right? That's part of the trick, right? And so for myself, we had an association for spina bifida and hydrocephalus. So I approached them 
started meeting the board of directors and asking if they would be interested in supporting this effort. And they were. So then I take time to meet other, you know, people with spina bifida with their help. And we just start meeting with them and talking. And I'm just kept trying to find different ways to connect with my peers. Um, Cause of course, in Alberta, we had what we called integration. And I, I have little, you know, cause in the seventies, they emptied all the institutions and sent us all home into the communities, which sounds lovely. And it was, I appreciated growing up with my family. Somebody's deciding to. But then, so, sorry, it's okay. So, 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 I guess for in the disability community, we're all segregated sort of now in our own communities, which is lovely. We grow up with our families. It's a great step in the right direction, but then we lose connection with each other. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually know anybody with spina bifida um, until I was 30 and I met another woman and I was beyond shocked at, at the, the similarities that we had and the similar struggles and I realized oh it's not just me and I'm not just lazy or I just you know don't know what I'm doing this is actually something that many people are facing mm -hmm. so yeah next slide I guess yeah and I just yeah. want to add on rocks like just a thought around this too is uh, when you're identifying your issue I think one of the things in my mind what I do when I'm identifying the issue is also really thinking about um, the relevant human rights declarations and articles that might align with that so that I can be aware like, okay, it's contravening, you know, this article of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, for example, like our right to play or our right to access to education. Um, so I always try to make a connect to the re relevant human rights documents so that I can ground myself and build, build the framework in the right way. Well, and so meeting Renee and back then it was Carrie at, through the John Humphrey Center. I mean, they really inspired me. You know, I was sort of in the middle of that work when I met these guys and I was like, okay, you know, and, and I learned about the convention on the rights of people with disabilities. And, and so doing a lot of reading and a lot of research to find out those things is really important as well. Awesome. Okay. So identify potential allies, because again, this is a huge task. And so you definitely want to know who's on your side and who you can draw in to be of help. And so I mentioned the Spina Bifida Association was one of those allies that I identified early on. Um, but it's about personal relationships. For me, I, I feel I'm a bit of a story collector. So the more people's stories I hear, the more motivated I get to help make change. Because like I start seeing the similarities in, in all the stories and, and the similar barriers that everyone's facing. And so I found it kind of motivating when I would meet other people and hear their stories and build a, a relationship with them. Um, and make them comfortable knowing that I was going to move forward with their stories. Not anonymous stories. I never disclose people's you know, personal information. But I do disclose the stories around the issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you also, number two is you look for organizational and community allies, look for organizations and support groups. And that's really important. And part of, part of the work back then is, is through my figuring out who's who in the community, I, I met a psychologist who said, Roxanne, I know so many women right now with spina bifida that are struggling. Would you host a women's group? I'm like, yeah. Um, and it was such a great experience for me. I hadn't thought of that, didn't realize that there were so many others um, with similar situations. And so we did that for a couple of years and it was really empowering. Um, it was life changing for some of the participants because they, because we don't, we're not, we're separated now into our own communities. We don't see others like ourselves. So it, it's your own community that sort of establishes the boundaries of who you are. And we had people come into the group that didn't know I could have children, I can get married, I can go to college. Of course you can do all of that. But you don't always know that when you're separated into your own little communities. So that was a really empowering um, situation, but that's one way that you can reach out to the communities. Um, you can, again, this may come up later in the slide, but you can 
you know, put a survey out. You can, there's, a, you know, many, many different ways that you can reach out to find out what people think about this, mm -hmm. about your issue that you've identified. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we talk about issue allies, other people that have the same issue. Um, it also may be that you look for, because again, we're dealing with a, a childhood disability. You may be able to find parents that, that really want to help. Um, you may find occupational therapists or medical people that, that see the struggles and see that people kind of get caught off at a certain age. And I mean, I did find those people because there, were, we, there was a clinic for children and the staff even though they weren't supposed to, were sneaking adults in with really, you know, that really needed attention. They were doing it anyways. Um, so that was an important learning lesson is, aha, these are very caring people, you know, that are doing the work, but they need permission, you know, from a, from a system to tell them that they can expand that work. And then, of course, you need to know what government department has influence over the issue, because there's always a government department that has policies and rules that, that people are following. Um, and then, yeah, how can you go about collaborating with them? Um, and, and that changes over the years. What's really interesting today is that we have advocates. We have a health advocate. We have a disability advocate. I don't think we, do we have a seniors advocate? Not anymore. Okay, but we should. <laughs> um, so it's important to look not only at maybe the, the department that would, government department that would control a clinic in the community, it's what other allies in other departments that, that you could bring in to have a voice in, in the conversation. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think adding on to that, one of the things I think I would add on is that if you're not quite as sure about that, the government of Alberta, as well as the other provincial governments, as well as the government of Canada, have databases all online of, of the departments and the people within those departments. It's like a little secret that all of us should know about. And when I send out the, the follow-up to you all, I will include the links to those um, because through that you can start to look okay I'm, it's under justice and you can start to see how it's organized and maybe what departments you should kind of target and it's a really good um, resource <clears throat> because the more that you can engage the bureaucrats, the more you can kind of also engage in longer, longer term change, I think sometimes. <clears throat> and the other thing, adding on this, the issue, at issue allies piece is recognizing like that strength and diversity in the sense that, um, for example, I've been working a lot on policing issues um, and prison issues. And so, working a lot, for example, with the Somali community on those issues, but recognizing if we can actually build alliances and strength with um, our colleagues from the indigenous community who are facing very similar issues, um, then we can have a much stronger platform to speak from. A lot of times we tend to speak from our issues from one community's perspective. And the more that we can kind of build solidarity, the stronger that we can be in like pushing the force forward. So I just wanted to add that piece on there as well. Absolutely. So um, identify potential targets. So, um, so who, the second point is who has the authority to make that change? That's somebody, that's your target and who can help you with that issue. Um, and so it's really important to know who you're asking this question of. Um, cause again, there's a lot of government departments and they keep changing names. And so you really got to stay on top of who's in charge of what and what department it is in. Sometimes I think they purposely make it difficult. So, <laughs> um, I don't know what else on targets, just that. Thinking yeah. about that, thinking about the realms of like both elected officials as well as public sector officials. I'm really thinking about that as well as maybe those larger mainstream agencies that might have influence on the issues, I think might be an idea as well. So, mm -hmm. okay. All right. So identify who will keep your target accountable. So it's the power of the, you know, I call it the power of the carbon copy, right? You CC people, you know, you CC the leader of the opposition always, you know, you CC, uh, yeah people in the community that might keep your target accountable for what they're doing. So like we say in the slide, if you're writing to the premier, you CC the leader of the opposition. If you're writing the head of home care, 
then you would, they are accountable to the Ministry of Health. So you would CC them. Um, that's really, I have to say, it's extremely powerful. Um, when you, because if you just send a letter to the Minister of Health and you don't CC anybody, you'll be lucky if you get a response, right? But if you CC the leader of the opposition, it's amazing how quickly people get on stuff. Or the media. So, yeah, or the media. I haven't used the media a lot just because I can't predict what they'll do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not as, you know... <laughs> Yeah, you really got to think carefully about when you involve the media because they can twist your words mm -hmm. in, in, into meanings you may or may not want. So you just have to be a little media training beforehand is a good thing when you start dealing with the media. But yes. Yeah. And the other thing about media would be maybe you're starting to notice that there's the specific journalist that centers on that issue quite a lot. So, for example, I was doing some stuff around um, seniors care recently. And there was a CBC reporter that had been doing um, some investigative journalism around senior care in facilities and stuff like that. So I kind of built a bit of a relationship with her so that she could walk the journey with me and kind of um, be in partnership with it. So she can kind of expose the issue and work with me in a way that it was in more in depth, but then also follow the issue in the long term. Because that's the other thing with the media is often it'll be like, one flash article and then it's kind of done. But if the idea I think about advocacy is kind of keeping this momentum going in the longer term. Well, and that's a really good point because I've had friends reach out to the media and spend like a month trying to explain the story to them and the story goes up and it's on CBC for 15 minutes. And that person who spent the time to bring a per very personal issue to light to try and affect change, it's so disappointing for them that they don't get, you know, it's a lot of effort for them and they don't get the return. Mm -hmm. So that's why I caution around the media is you really got to kind of know what you're doing and targeting and lower your expectations um, as to what they may or may not be able to help you with. And I will also say about the media is they are, they love to go after the government. Um, but when it's a private company or a private organization that sponsors their, uh, station radio station whatever it can get tricky mm -hmm. because they don't want to lose the advertising dollars and so they're not going to talk about a private company um, they're only going to talk about government so that's another really important thing to know okay, okay. so develop your ask you want to be solution focused always mm -hmm. um, and that's something i had to learn because i started this like doing this work like 20 years ago and I was a little angry about things and, and I had to realize that people don't respond to anger at all and so you have to learn even though you have a right to be upset and you have a right to be angry you can't be so you've got to work that out in some way with friends with a support group to get that anger out and then make it affect, you know find the right words to to look for that solution um, so when you're developing your ask, you want to describe the issue uh, as in much detail as you can, but you always need to be aware that people will only read so much. So I did try to keep documents that I send out two pages, three tops, because nobody's going to read it. So you've got to, you know, and, and I will say again, the first letter that I wrote for that clinic, it took me a year. I wrote it and I rewrote it. I sent it out to the community. I got a whole bunch of feedback and I just about wanted to, my head was going to explode because I had people say, oh, that'll never work. And, you know, all the critical feedback and you let it sink in for a while, <coughs> excuse me. And you realize that some of the feedback was really good. Um, and yeah. And, and then, but it just takes a long time to develop that ask and to pare it down into something that is readable to for like an MLA. That's the other, you know, and again, I'm kind of going off topic, but the other thing that's really important to know when you're writing to like an MLA, they are not an academic. They don't necessarily have academic language. They could be, you know, a farmer from rural Alberta that, you know, really knows his community and, you know, is motivated to help his community. So you have to put it in language that everybody can understand. Um, so second point is what does the remedy look like to you? 
So that's really important when you're, you know, going to bring forth a concern is that you know what you want. And so for me with that, I wanted a clinic. I knew exactly how I wanted to do it. Um, but I will tell you, I didn't get what I asked for. So again, you have to be prepared that they are not going to, you know, whoever's in charge isn't necessarily going to give you everything you want. So that's why you really want to explore the issue, describe it as big as you can and, and have that remedy as detailed as possible. So you offer the potential solution. And again, I say in a letter, no more than two pages, lay out the issue, who is affected. Um, the other thing that I did is I initially wrote a, an ask, a letter to, to um, the head of Alberta Health Services. And when they responded favorably, then I did a survey of my population to prove that what I was saying is what you know, the people needed and wanted. And then I did a position paper. Um, you could also write a letter to the editor to, to bring the uh, issue up in, in sort of the media. So I often use the letters to the editor. I found them to be quite um, easy to work with and would often be interested in, in publishing. But again, it's got to be like so small when it's a letter to the editor. And I often had a few fights with them because they want to edit my words. And I know you cannot edit my words and change the context or the meaning of what I'm trying to say. I will edit it if it's too long, right? But I don't want you editing it. So we, I had a, quite a few interesting little uh, interactions with the, the editors of the, that it was usually the Edmonton Journal, I think, but they were lovely and, you know, they got it in the end. So, yeah. So, again, I brought up the fact that you want to survey, survey the population that's affected by the issue. Make sure you're asking them the right questions. Um, so you want to ask yes and no questions, but you could also ask a few open ended questions is why do you need this? Um, because you may gain information you hadn't even thought about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then you want to ask, um, you want to check in with your allies and make sure that they are still supporting what you're trying to do um, is very important. Did I miss anything, Renee? <laughs> uh, no, I think, I think, yeah, that checking in with allies and kind of sharing your work is what's really important that stands out for me, Rox, is just like, what I notice is just writing something and getting those different eyes to look at it and um, is a really kind of critical piece. And this is what a lot of you advocates are doing under Stride is really starting to create the language. When we do the intake, it's like creating the language we need to be able to like know what that person wants as a remedy, but also then to describe it. But then also, again, like linking it to those human rights documents. Because um, one of the points I think is really important is that when we use their language of human rights, it allows us to take it out of that emotional personal space, which, you know, Rox, you talked about like this, this, this anger that can sit with people sometimes um, and that comes across in the letters and I've seen so many times even just letters coming into the John Humphrey Center you can see the emotion coming through the letters but sometimes when the emotions there it's not fully comprehensible about what it is and, and what you want so it's really kind of getting objective. Um, and One then, thing I realized in all the meetings that I was attending trying to figure out who's who and what's going on and what where are the places that I could do this is that, and again, I can only speak for people with disabilities. I don't have a lot of experience in any other sort of marginalized group, but for us, I, I could see in these meetings that everybody wanted to tell their story because it was so impactful to them that we never got to a bigger solution because the entire meeting would be, would become a bitch session, right? Uh, that's at least how professionals or the administrators might see it because there wasn't, they did not see something productive happening. Where I know from my own experience and from trauma is that sometimes you need to tell that story before you can get, move on to the next phase. And we're not often, and so many of my peers, I could see that they were still at that point. They just needed somebody to hear and validate them. And so you have to find ways to do that because it's important, but that might not be where you invite government officials, mm -hmm. right? Is into those circles where they're gonna hear way too much information and they're just gonna become confused. So, you know, you have those meetings and then you get a smaller group that can tackle the larger issue. Yes.
awesome. Jess just made a point on, uh, I, I missed this comment before, was just a note on targets is perhaps knowing their rules on how to address them. For example, I learned how the provincial assembly does not accept online petitions, yet the federal government does. That's a good, good note, Jess. I just wanted to make Very sure. Very good. That yes. Yeah, the rules of engagement. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how they will listen. Yes. Yeah, and I had learned, and again, this is many, many years ago, but I had also learned back then that if you, if more than 10 people email a ministry about a specific problem, it, it escalates, right? It'll escalate it up higher, right? So it's kind of to know, you know, so you could gather, that's another strategy is you could gather 15 people to write, the government about one issue mm -hmm. and then it, it kind of gets escalated up the chain slightly and, and you might get more attention around it. Mm -hmm. So develop your communication strategy. This is very, very important. And it may seem, I don't know how to explain, but again, when your human rights have been violated, feeling asking with gratefulness seems very difficult right? And I say initial ask with gratefulness and persistence. Um, because it's important to realize that it's the systems that are really what is screwed up. It's not the people working in the systems. I would say, you know, a very large majority of those people working in those systems know it's screwed up and would love to find a way to fix it, but they don't have the power. I mean, I worked for the federal government for 15 years. You don't have a lot of power when you're in working in the system. But when, you know, me as an individual advocate, not working for anyone, I had a lot of power. Um, so it's, but it's important, yeah, that you be grateful. So, you know, whenever I interacted with like the managers of Alberta Health Services, I was extremely persistent. They heard from me constantly, but I was always very nice and very grateful for their attention. Um, and I know sometimes when you're, when people are suffering, it seems silly to have to do that. But you do, because they don't, they don't know. They don't know how bad things are. And they're not going to hear you if you come at them really angry. And they'll so, shut the door. Yeah, they will shut the door. They'll label you as like the crazy person and, and you know, which is terrible. Um, but they do that. Mm -hmm. And so you got to follow up. And the follow up needs to be with gratefulness and persistence never anger and that's probably the hardest thing that I had to learn because I'm angry when my people don't have access basic access to housing how can you like <laughs> it just doesn't even make sense to me that I could not be angry you know be mm -hmm. angry but it's something you learn as you grow um and you see that when you do have that the right attitude you you make some stri you make strides <laughs> um and it's important so and request a meeting and follow up so i had i set some parameters for myself when i was advocating that i would write once a month and i would phone every three months you know or no maybe it was the other way around i would phone every month because that was a bit easier and then i would follow up with an email um or letter um every three months to say, hey, I'm still here. What's happening? Have we done anything? Where, where are we at? Um, and that's really important because it keeps you in their, you know, in their thoughts. Because, you know, these systems that are broken are very overwhelming for the people that work in them as well. Yeah. And they can easily get distracted by the current issue of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beauty. So um, this is about once you, you know, you've made your ask and you've gotten, um, you've gotten a positive response. So it's just really important to inform everybody, tell the world. So when I got the clinic um, finally opened almost immediately, to tell you the truth, I wrote this letter that it took me a year to write. Three weeks later, the head of Alberta Health Services called me and said, today, we see adults like as of today, and see, I get teary just talking about it. But I, I said, not enough. I need a grand opening, and I need it in the news. And that took me probably three more years to get that. And I just, persistence, not giving up, being really nice. We really need this, you know? And so I got it on the media. We had like a, a ceremony and, and a whole bunch of people came. And, and it's important to do that. Celebrate, tell people, 
you know, because that will hopefully get it out into the consciousness of the world that this is possible and this is how things should be. So yeah, inform society, inspire others, you know, offer to share. You know, I was offering to share my letter to, that I wrote that took me a year to write to anybody who wanted to see it and how I made that argument because it was a complicated argument. It wasn't, it wasn't simple. I, I delved into the psychological uh, effects and, and, you know, how the doctors that we see as children become parental figures in our lives, you know, and to just cut us off at 18 is cruel, you know, um, without any plan for the future. And so to, you know, it took me a while to offer that, to come up with that whole argument. And so it's important to, again, we are all in this together, you know, and to share what you've done and how it's worked, I think is really important. And to be free with that, and never to be proprietary or territorial over that, because, you know, as a community, we want to help each other. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see this journey, I think, of a process when you go through this. It's one, I think what I'm hearing from you, Roxanne, is like this grounding in this low expectation. That sounds really bad, but really setting your sights high and asking high, but being really understanding that it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of persistence. It's going to take a lot of swallowing of your pride um, and just kind of moving forward and, and, and this piece. And I, I think what I pull from this too, and I think it, what I've seen in my work is just that capacity to put, put it down into a really constructive narrative is often what's really hard, challenging for people, but it's also what's so critical to be able to communicate it to those next levels and be able to push it through. Um, so, well, and today in a, in a world where we just think everything should be right now, like send an email, get a response. No, this is a long-term thing and you need to think carefully about this. You need to ask the right person because if you don't ask the right person, you'll be spinning in circles for two years, right? So it's important to be slow and deliberate about how you're going about this and ask a million questions and ask and re-ask and, and find your allies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that, I, maybe what we can do um, is, is open it up, hey? Eh? Like if anybody wants to kind of add any thoughts or comments or ask any questions, maybe there's um, a specific I, thought that you have that maybe you want to we want to strategize about, feel free to maybe put up your hand. You can see at the bottom of the participants list, you can kind of like raise your hand um, or you can kind of put comments in the group chat. Um, okay, Jess, go for it. Hi, um, I was wondering, so in terms of like um, connecting with community and um, finding your allies in that sense, um, if it is a more sensitive issue like sex work where there's potentially like um like legal ramifications and and you know it's a, a really vulnerable place for a lot of people like how do you safely build community and and connect with people like and provide a space where they can like safely be out in that space while ensuring that it's not gonna like you know you're not going to get like interlopers, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to take a stab at that one? Well, I don't know. I mean, we didn't have a lot of, like, again. It makes me think certainly, about the all. Yeah. And so, okay. So, I mean, you always want to make sure that the people that are affected by the issue are the dominant voice in the room. There should be more of us than them whatever the, you know, uh, you know, like, so when I talked to more people with spina bifida than I did anybody else, you know, that, that it's their needs that are most important. So yeah, we need to find ways to, to make them safe. But part of that is not having more of everyone else than they, than them in the room um, is at, at least for my community, you know, now it's going to be different in different communities, depending on, you know, on what, how to create that safety but one of it is that for me especially in the area of human rights is we need to be the dominant voice and i can tell you like you know go to a go to a committee on homeless how many homeless people are in that meeting right probably none or maybe one or two 
right? And they're outnumbered. And so they're going to be afraid to speak. Um, and this happens way too often is that we have, we have meetings about issues and we don't include the people with the lived experience in those meetings. Um, but Jess, you bring up a really important point is how do we find a space? And, and definitely you say interlopers, but yes, you, you want people to be safe in that space and be able to talk. I think what kind of comes for me from that rocks too is there, there's a couple of strategies that was coming to my mind as, as you were talking too about this. And there's, there's kind of a couple different ways that if I were to attack an advocacy, the different ways I would come about it. And it's like really one, there's like centering on like a core team of people, which one, either you're kind of convening together and those people are the people that are affected by the issue. Um, cause there is healing and coming together and growth and coming together, but in a really kind of exclusive inv invite way and building like a core team, or you can build a core team like one-on-one -on -one with people. But the trick is, is like Rock said, is making sure that that voice is the prominent one that's pushing it forward. The other thing that was standing out to me also is like when you're identifying your targets and when you identify potential allies, um, one of the strategies actually could be um, to make it in, intentional education of those allies so that they are communicating the right messages. So for example, um, if somebody's on the Premier's Council of Persons with Disabilities, for example, but they don't have disabilities, but yet they're representative there, um, how do we make sure that they're communicating the right information? So there's an education piece of, of almost like latching onto some allies who have that influence to make sure that they know what they're talking about. So there's like individual relationships and building this kind of core team, but also like really kind of strengthening knowledge and allies. Cause I think there's a lot of people who are allies who are out there who get on committees and stuff like that and all the best intentions, but maybe they don't really fully understand the issue from the perspective of the people who live it. Um, so a, I hope that helps a little bit, Jess. Um, it, it, it helps in other ways. I guess like, I'm gonna turn my video off for a minute. Uh, like this is like, like this is something I have lived experience with. So I'm trying to like, I wanna be able to like create a support network in Lethbridge for, for other people, but I just don't really know like where to start because people are so afraid to like like to be out in any way so it's like how do you get together and and form that support network when everybody's afraid yeah well and it may just start with one or two yeah. right and 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 then that yeah. you know it's like a ripple effect oh and then a few more people hear about it and hear that it's safe mm -hmm. you know and so it may be just a, again lengthen you know it might take you six months mm -hmm. but yeah. to do it slowly Okay. The notion of the spiral, like starting with, you know, a small, small group of two or of three even, and that slowly you start to bring people in and it grows and it bigs. And then what you know is you have a strong, solid foundation by which to advocate as a team and, and you can trust the people that are there. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And I know that you have said there's some great people on this call down from that area that I think would probably be really great to touch base on with that. Um, so Roxanne, Tara has a question, um, Tara, I don't know if you want to come on the mic and ask it, but she says she's put together a resolution for conciliation for human rights and she's never done this before and how should she approach it? Um, has anyone else experienced putting together a res resolution for conciliation? I don't know, Rox, if you've ever been through that or if you have any thoughts. No, so what that exactly does that mean? Let's get Tara on here to, Tara, yeah. do you want to unmute and maybe share us a little bit more so we can talk it through a bit? Hi, yes. Um, I filed the human rights complaint and um, the defending side replied and the case basically went straight to conciliation. Is that the right word? Yeah. And um, I didn't have a chance to reply to the fabricated untruth. So um, what, okay. I've never experienced this situation before. So um, what would be the best approach apart from asking for way more than what I'm hoping to get? Rox, are you okay if I jump right in? Yep. Okay. Um, 
So Tara, I think with this one, and this is the natural process with those human rights complaint processes is they don't allow you to respond um, to in writing to that first kind of get go, um, which is challenging because then you enter into an immediate consultation conciliation meeting um, with the other party and it's not it's, it's uncomfortable. Um, what I would suggest is really um, kind of like Roxanne has talked about with these like articulating your message is really use that chance in the conciliation meeting to do that response to make that case, make it solid so that when you're in there, you can feel comfortable in actually explaining to it. Conciliation is a really great place to get out your emotions, but I think it's also a really important place to be like really targeted on responding to what they put forward because otherwise you won't have the chance um, and also maybe thinking about having somebody in there with you um, to support you in communicating that message they can just be sitting there but just i think that that can be really helpful so if i were you i would be like looking at their what they submitted and really kind of articulating your responses to those and your asks based on those responses um, because that's how your conciliation will be strong and successful is if you can just really focus on, you know, yeah, you said this, but this is not reality. This is what my experiences was, but also articulating the impact that this is having on you um, is really critical. So I don't know if that helps. Or Rox, if you have some things to add. Just that, like, again, you know, it brings out, you know, you really want to spend a bit of time thinking about, okay, what will that target's argument be as to why they won't do this, right? So you are already want to have, you want to sit and think about, okay, why are they going to tell me no? And you want to have an argument ready as to why they can't say no, right? So you have to do some of that. Um, okay. I don't know what that is, but, you know, you have to think about okay, the reason. Um... Uh, sorry for a second question, but um, if I prepared a response to their initial response that I couldn't reply to earlier, sh should I be permitted to read that aloud during the meeting? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank yes. you so much. And I think kind of in response to what Rock said about um, being prepared for what you think, they're, why you think they're going to say no, okay. really come at it from an asset based approach where you're like, I know they're going to say no because of this, but I need to tell them the benefits of them doing this, like really articulating the business case for why they need to say yes and how no, you know, is it is, you know, just kind of really articulating that I think would be really helpful, but you can definitely you the conciliation process from what I understand is that you're, you're allowed to present yourself in the way that you feel most comfortable doing. And if that means reading something, then by all means do it. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Awesome. Thanks, Tara. Okay. Um, Rox, we have another one. Tansi Oki, hello from JC. My question is, are there tools, practices, strategies to develop a constructive narrative when beginning to develop your communication strategy? Do you have any? I don't know, JC, if you want to come on and, and maybe articulate. Hi. Yeah, Hi. sorry, I don't have um, I don't have video capability right now. No problem. Um, so when rocks you you were going through your number six on the slides developing your communication strategy, and um, uh, Renee, I think it was you. You said you know it, it, there's uh, some strengths around developing a constructive narrative. Mm -hmm um how like do you want to are you able to like elaborate on that like is that sort of constructing a narrative from the very start and sort of like documenting all this stuff like um in terms of like influencing um or like really sort of pushing the threads at that systemic racism i think it's a matter of for myself is i'm gonna write it once and then I'm going to go through it again and I'm going to take out some of the emotion. I'm going to, you know, strengthen some of the points. And so, you know, the first time you sort of put that narrative out, it's going to be emotional and it might be angry and then you work on it. So you get it to a point where people can read it and hear it. Um, and so that's at least what happens with me is I write and I rewrite and I edit and I, you know, until I get it to a point where it's concise 
and, and not, yeah. And, and something that people will want to read that might be interesting for them to read. And I know some of this seems, I don't know how to explain, um, petty or not petty, but you know, oh, stupid yeah. that you have to do these things, but you do. You have to think about who is that person on the other end and what can I do to intrigue them to continue reading? You know, so sometimes I might add a little bits of humor in it or something that might catch their eye to keep them, them going. And it depends on the issue. I mean, there's some really serious issues where there's no humor, you know, <laughs> there's nothing humorous about this situation, but, but it's important to really think about the person you're reaching, you know, um, what do they need to hear? in order to engage. Yeah, I think my tactics when I'm kind of building a strategy is I'll often be documenting a lot of it. Um, so cap, you know, capturing the issues or the cases that are happening, but at the same time, I kind of have these two documents going, whereas one is kind of me trying to articulate it um, using human rights language and connecting it to articles um, and conventions and stuff like that. So I kind of always, it's always for me, I always have like this evolving working document of my language, which is built on from the documentation that I'm doing. I don't know if that makes sense. It's like I, I have to build it as I go and evolve it and, and, and work with a team to kind of do that. I don't know if that helps JC as well. Oh yes, for sure. I was, I'm just wondering, um, with my role working in community and engagement, um, sh yeah, should I be already having sort of this this narrative that I'm building up? Um, so what you said about you know this evolving document, because mm -hmm. um, there's ways to sort of um, educate or share a story using like academic language yeah. and then also using non-academic language yeah but I think it was yeah like think about the person who you are trying to reach Roxanne you had mentioned that so thank you so much I appreciate it you're very welcome uh, can uh, I, I, I just go have for a it. note to say on that and it's a uh, um, the articulation between the academic language and the lived experiences of people are a great tool to use um, when you're reaching to certain people like when you're trying to build those alliances with people that maybe are academics or people that are in certain non-for-profit organizations they hear a lot the language but it has to be backed up by the 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 lived experiences of people because that um that kind of fills the content that, that the concepts of academics uh okay. handle so i think that that's a good for government i find that really tricky mm -hmm. It's uh -huh. the lived experiences that scare them out a little bit. That yeah. has been my experience with them. It's like if you write lived experiences within a document for the government, they just, whoa. So it mm -hmm. depends on where they're going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thank you. All right, Valerie, I'll pass the floor over to you. If you want, if you want to unmute, you can. For some reason, I can't get the gallery view over here, but that's fine. If you can hear me. Um, my concern with presenting um, presenting to government um, uh, departments is that and my personal belief is and with several allies is there are specific ideological political cultures that were that we deal with and um, how do you get around that? Because that political culture is pervasive and it comes down the whole department. You get that message. <clears throat> this, is, this is what the minister believes. This is what our government believes. So how do you, and for sure, there might be the odd person, as Roxanne has said, who, who would agree with you. But the message is, this is, this is what is our ideology. So that I, I struggle with that all the time. Rox, do you want to attack that one? I have some immediate thoughts. You go for it. Okay, my immediate thoughts are every political party um, is committed to these universal 
documents on human rights, even our UCP party uses the language of human rights a lot. What we need to understand is there's a benefit when we frame our languages and our narratives in using human rights language and referring to specific conventions is that our governments are legally obligated to meet the demands of these international conventions and standards. So when we use that kind of language saying, according to the convention of this, um, we have the right to this, and thus our government of Alberta or Canada is responsible um, for the realization of that right, but yet this is what we're seeing. So we're, we're missing the gap. Um, so in order to achieve that right, which we are internationally obligated to do, um, these are some of our suggestions. So that's why I really human rights language allows us to take it out of the partisan politics. Mm -hmm. um, allows us to get us out of ideology because a human right and, and I mean I could go into like a lot of details about this but but no matter what um, human rights legislation is primacy law both here in, 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 in Alberta in Canada but it also we have these international standards by which our governments have ratified and they've agreed to so we have to remind them because most government bureaucrats and elected officials that they don't even really know about what human rights are and what our obligations are. So we have to educate and remind them in these letters. So that just was an immediate reaction to that. I don't know, Rox, if you have anything else you'd think you want to add to that one. Well, just that this is not easy work. Like I'm still angry from this advocacy project that ended like a long time ago already. It's been over 10 years and I'm still twitchy about going out and meeting MLAs because they demean you, they devalue you, they use every, you know, and again, I'm not even sure it's intentional. It's just the way our society is. You know, I'm a woman, a small woman with a disability. And so immediately I am patted on the head. I am patronized. I'm like, oh, you, you know, mansplain to. Um, it's hard and you can't react, right? Because you don't want to, just, you know, you don't want to affect the relationship so you kind of have to laugh and you know play this little game and it, it's hard it's hard work it's not easy it's not easy to make friends with people that do not share your ideology you know and so but you have to yeah you know so you've got to find a way and it may be that you have a friend that you know like there's just you really got to be creative about how you go about these things and use every single resource available to you so for me as a woman with a disability, maybe there's a man I, you know, in my life that has some authority that might get me somewhere I can't get on my own. You know, like, I don't like that. I don't like to think that that's how we work. But when you're trying to get an issue resolved, you need to go at it in every way possible. Because again, especially for a marginalized community, because the odds are against you, period. Mm -hmm. And you got to know that going in and you got to be ready. Like you got to know that they're going to say no. They're going to use every trick in the book to make you go away. And you just have to smile, you know, like just a silly little example, just to lighten things up. But when I was a student, I went to Nate, Nate Business Tower. There was one elevator. Do you think that elevator ever had room for me? Never. Never. It was oh. full of a whole, it was completely full of able-bodied people. And I use a wheelchair. I would put a big smile on my face and I would wheel in and people would fall out because what do you do like I need this you don't I would it would be such a blessing in my life to be able to walk up a flight of stairs and and I just yeah so anyways but see you just put a smile on your face and you do it anyways <laughs> no fear awesome okay Diana I noticed you I know you had a, a question too I'll pass it over to you hi um, firstly, uh, thank you so much for all the information. This has been super helpful and I loved how it was broken down into steps. So that's really, um, just like really productive. Um, I also really like the point about, um, like when you said that it's like, don't attack the individual, like it's the issue. Um, and I think that's like an awesome rule for just like, kind of just life in general. I think it's, 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 it's great. Um, because I mean just as an example you know you go to a store and like whatever like there's an issue and you know 
you immediately want to get upset at the clerk when it's like not their fault because they're just like working and they don't have any like control over the rules and so they're just you know like a teenager just like working a part-time job and it's super easy to want to like get really upset at them but um I think it's like really helpful to take a step back and to be like okay like this is not like you know they didn't make this rule or this isn't their fault like it just this is the way it is and to just sort of like look at the issue so I thought that was super um awesome that you brought that up um, and then I guess just to touch on another point that you talked about, um, like taking emotion out of like your um, letters and things like that. I recently had an experience where I had to, um, I suppose, advocate for myself, if you want to put it that way. And um, it was an unexpected situation as well. And um, I remember being so upset and even, yeah, I was like so upset. I was like, oh my gosh, like I've, you know, done everything to prevent, like this is so like, why would someone do this? Or, you know, just things like that. And, um, like, I'm very lucky. I had a couple people where I could, you know, talk to you about it and to, you know, brainstorm ideas, but that was definitely the resounding opinion where it was like, okay, you know what, now it's just facts. Like now you just, whenever you respond, it's just factual, make it very, you know, professional. And, um, like if you're upset, like, call a friend, you know, talk to this person and, you know, find other ways to vent that emotion. Cause it's true. Like when you're writing, you know, with the email, you want to be like, you want to like insert this thing, even not, even though it's not like, um, you know, super emotional, but just something to express like how you feel. And then, you know, taking a step back and being like, okay, am I actually like saying anything with that? Or is that just so I can feel good about like including this and so that they know and so that was really interesting because, um, like you said, it took a lot of like reading and rereading and sending it to someone else and that person being like, well, like you should take that out because like, you know, <laughs> it's not like unprofessional, but it doesn't really accomplish anything. You're just like basically saying you're upset professionally. Right. And it's just like, there's no need for that. Like, just like, you know, tell someone else and it's just like, okay. And so it's hard because you just really want to be like, oh, <laughs> like, I'm so mad. Um, yeah, you just get so frustrated. So, I mean, I thought that was interesting because it's, it's like so easy to like say that. And then when you're doing it, you just like, it's so true. You just want to just really like include all these things and you come up with all these like one liners in your head and then you're like, oh no, you can't do that. Like it doesn't. And I think it helps to go back to the fact that, okay, like that doesn't get anything done. Like if you, and like you mentioned, it kind of almost works against you if you are very upset and emotional and they're like, okay, this person's just upset. Like what they're saying isn't really valid or you know like it doesn't really matter and it's so not fair but it's so true and then it does um like when you do it like when you just like present the facts you're like okay that does sound like better like it does it's more clear and the person will understand that so anyways that's just i just like wanted to um share my experience with that um but my question um so you mentioned that so i think that is also outrageous so you said that um from basically when you're considered a pediatric patient you have access to a pediatrician um and then basically at age 18 you just like you're just cut off basically like you don't have access so that is um i think like a, a tragedy like that's super like there is no continuity in that um, and I'm just particularly interested in that because um, I, I work in healthcare, and so I'm really interested in um, sort of those aspects as well. Um, and I was just wondering, um, in your advocacy, like, what did you have challenges engaging healthcare providers? Like, did you have, like, I guess, what were the challenges in that realm? I'm sure there were many. Um, and I'm just, I guess I'm wondering how you, like whether you had allies in certain fields and stuff and whether that was helpful or whether, um, you know, you had different strategies to sort of educate um, different healthcare providers about what you needed or what you were um, advocating for, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, it's, again, I said in the beginning how important it is to, and I don't mean like, you got to completely be responsible for it. Like if you want this project to go forward, there's just a million different ways it can go sideways. And so it really requires that person in the center to just keep inching forward because you know, you're often told even by your own community members, by family members, Oh, you're never going to do this. Oh, they'll never like you get the constant negative um, feedback. 
and you have to rise above that and, and know that, no, this is a human right. And I'm going to assert myself, you know, and, and, and not to come, you know, not to come about it as a victim, but as somebody who wants to assert their rights. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's just that your allies aren't always obvious to you. Right. And so that's why you have to be really open-minded to who might support you and who might not. Right. Because you might think like for myself, Oh, well, all the parents of the kids, I mean, they should be on board with all of this because their kids are going to grow up, right? And they're going to be in the exact same position that I'm in. No, it doesn't quite work that way. The reason being, and again, it's not, it's nobody's being, it's not because of bad intentions. It's that the parents are absolutely overwhelmed with the, the existing conditions that they're dealing with. Like I know even from my mom at 18, she, <laughs> I joke about this, but she bought me a suitcase because <laughs> it was enough. She spent 18 years of my life being my advocate and she was amazing, you know, but at 18, they're tired. They've had enough and they want to believe this is again, this is this weird thing where they want to believe that they, they've done all their work. And they've done everything that the doctors have told them to do. So I should just be able to go out and be like everybody else. And it's not like that. And, and even in your own family unit, they don't necessarily want to believe that. Um, so I find that, you know, like parents who you think would be your allies are not necessarily your allies because they've been conditioned to believe things that are not true. And I felt like I spent so many years of my adult life saying, but it's not like that. Yeah. You know, my mom, mom, my mom would be, wow, that's not right. They should just do that. But they don't. And because her experience was different because she had a child with a disability, right? Not an adult with a disability. I found it very hard to even talk to my family about some of these things. So disability is an interesting, uh, you know, phenomenon. Um, because in racism, it's usually groups of people against one another, but it, it, with ableism, that can start within your own family unit. And, and again, I do this from a place of gratitude and I'll get teary, but I do this because I had parents that loved me and did absolutely everything they could to make me an independent human. And, and I owe it to them to continue fighting and to, to make this world better because they gave everything they had and I need to do the same because it's not over. It's not enough. And we've regressed. That's the other unfortunate thing is that I grew up, came into adulthood in the eighties and things were lovely in the eighties. We were all optimistic and hopeful and about how things were going to be. And unfortunately we had a government that came in and destroyed our healthcare. And along with it, a lot of my, well, a lot of my hopes and dreams. And so all you can do is fight, and, but do it in a way that doesn't get you shut down. <laughs> so you, that people hear you. Did you have, like, was it hard to get folks within the health system to listen to you? At the beginning? So this is very biased, but I'm going to say it anyways. The reason I had success in the healthcare industry is because it was women. Everybody I dealt with from the head of Alberta Health Services at the time was Sheila Weatherill, all the way down, it was women. They listened. I got shut down so many times by men. Men would not hear me, would not listen to me, honestly. Uh, you know, because I initially started advocating because I needed somewhere to live. So I started advocating because I needed housing. And I got shut down so hard so many times. I, I never want to talk to a builder ever again in my life because they couldn't have demeaned me more and made me feel less visible, you know, less important and invisible. It was terrible. And so I moved to healthcare because I did have some success. The women would listen. They would hear me. Nece couldn't necessarily do anything, but at least they were listening. So anyways, very biased kind of uh, answer. Okay. <laughs> well, we we have quite some chat going on in the chat and talking, um, there's some conversations going, Isma, Judy, Jess, kind of talking about like how lived experience, we need to really frame that as expert uh, knowledge so that we kind of get past that 
some of the barriers we face with government. And I think that's absolutely critical. Um, and as Isma said, it's like having members who are going through the issues should be the face of the change instead of the people who have no idea when that constantly leads us to this position. So yes, 100%. And then Dave has a chat saying he's working towards developing an advocacy area while identifying and growing our approach as well as a team of allies. The advocacy is in the area of special needs abuse at many levels. I'm looking at the approach of including this area within developing an awareness network of and community in regards to a day in the life of a special needs person slash adult to bring and develop awareness in regards to assumptions, stereotypes, this is a thumbnail sketch, but I wanted to share if anyone has experience in regards to my specific or general mention, please message and we can connect. The advocacy area of abuse and trauma is personal within our immediate family. I wanted to share in this safe space. Um, so I don't know, if, yeah, if you have any thoughts or feelings or suggestions for Dave uh, Rocks as, as he moves forward in that journey. I have um, something to say about that. Go for it. Okay, special needs. Oh my gosh. Lived experience. My um, nephew was born with um, multiple sclerosis or muscular muscular dystrophy and um, cerebral palsy. Anyways, he ended up being um, apprehended by children's services and put in a special needs home foster home and the last time he was with the family was at his twin sister's first birthday party and that's 24 years ago and they haven't seen each other since but during those 24 years he was at six months, he got apprehended from his parents because um, the children's services thought, assumed that the parents cannot take care of this child at home. So he was apprehended and put in foster care. And every time we made an appointment to see the boy, to have visitation for him, with him, um, a day, two days before, the appointment would be cancelled. <clears throat> Anyways, around 16 years of age, um, I was told by then, Kaina Children's Services took over, um, had taken over Children's Services and they had de delegated authority for protection services. And I worked there at the time. So I talked to one of the child welfare workers and apparently um, he was removed from that foster home because he was being physically abused. And this poor little boy had just learned how to crawl at eight years old. He didn't talk and he couldn't see. So like we do need some child advocacy there or special needs advocacy because it is really rampant out there for special needs children and adults to be get to be getting abused physically mentally emotionally probably even financially so can i make a suggestion just right off the bat because again it's it's a bit triggering for me but the uh -huh. the use of special needs those words um, don't sit well with those of us with disabilities. Uh -huh. so I would start there is children grow up and they can't grow into the label of special needs where the term people with disabilities is something that is internationally used, um, you know, in our human rights legislation. So I know that's a simple thing, but I, I just know for, again, because I have, you know, so many friends with disabilities that 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 label that we've started using about 20 years ago um, for kids is really difficult for them because then they hit 18 and that's not an appropriate label anymore. Mm. And, it, and so that's one, I mean, I know that's really, really simple, 
but but it, it would it's empowering for the person with the disability to be referred to as something that is recognized internationally as a group right and it's about 20 percent of the population so suddenly when you you know use that phrase people with disabilities they have a much bigger group that they're a part of mm -hmm. um right where i find with our children we can't do that because we're infantilizing them by using certain words to describe them it's we need to use words that they can grow into and I appreciate that some of them may not, like that is a reality of the world I live in, you know, even in the spina bifida community, many of our kids still don't even make it to adulthood. And that's why some of our systems aren't designed uh, properly because 50 years ago, a lot of us didn't even live. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if they hadn't come up with some surgeries in the 60s. Um, I wouldn't be alive today. But I think that's really important in, in looking at the bigger picture of how we define the issue and the problems um, is to, you know, and I know that isn't really answering your question, but I think it's an important discussion we need to have um, because often, especially in the area of disability, we spend way too much time talking about what to call us rather than dealing with the issues at hand. And I'm kind of doing this, the exact same thing here <laughs> today, right? <laughs> But, but just in, in doing a lot of thought and a lot of thinking about this, is that's one thing I think we should do, right, here in Alberta, is stop using that terminology. And same as handicapped. I mean, I know it's still on signs places, but handicapped actually it's a derogatory is begging on the street, right? That's the, the historical meaning of that word, handicapped, is hand in cap, or cap in hand. Right. And so it's important that was we do the work. And I just want to share that with all of you, because I think these are important little tidbits that that sometimes can make our argument stronger as well mm -hmm. when we're using the right terminology. And so if we're making a human rights argument, we want to use people with disabilities mm -hmm. in our arguments. Yeah. And I think, Lenore, what you bring up and what Dave brings up, too, is this piece that Roxanne talked about, about like, how do we when we talk about disability rights, how do we center on the child effectively so that the parent, like, because the parents end up being the voice, but sometimes those parents aren't the right voice. Um, and so how do we really center disability advocacy around the child? And that's, that's really challenging. And I, Dave, I'll look forward to those conversations with you as we move forward, because um, it is a really serious issue. And as Roxanne has said, is it's, you know, it hit me really hard when you, you said something about it last month, Roxanne, and it's been sitting me ever since, is that, you know, yeah, in the home for children with disabilities, oftentimes that's not a healthy space at all. It doesn't encourage that well-being and that growth. Um, and so we have to be conscious of that when we're doing, and not saying that there are families that do great, as Roxanne did, but we have to find this balance of how do we like make sure the voice of the, the person with the disability is really heard in that effort. So it's an interesting one. So I'll look forward to those conversations. And if anybody's interested in that conversation yet, yeah, do add your note to the chat, because I know Dave and I are having a meeting this week. <laughs> okay, well, we've come to 11.23, kind of the end of our time. If there's maybe one more, comment or question we could kind of take that otherwise we can we can wrap it up and be a little bit more informal on here i think we're good okay well any kind of closing words roxanne before you leave off i just hope this was helpful to you all um you know it's a complicated uh, uh it's complicated human rights and how to advocate for yourself and how to you assert yourself it's not easy and the only other thing I want to say is being a child with a disability I, of course I am very articulate so believe me I I was hurt because I made damn sure but but that I just want to say that I have a lot of friends who have brain injuries I have one friend who has down syndrome and you gotta listen right he doesn't you know like they know what they want and what they want to say, but sometimes we are not hearing it because we're expecting a certain type of words to come out of their mouths or a certain way to speak. And so I just encourage everyone that, that even people that may have brain injuries, speech impediments, uh, you know, 
they know like we need to make extra efforts for them to be heard um, because they know what they want and they know what they need and we make assumptions like I have a friend here who is in the building that is very very difficult to understand but he is incredibly intelligent and clear if you just take the time to hear what he's saying but sometimes for me that may be him repeating the same word 30 times and I sit there and but I admit to him I don't know what he's saying can you repeat it and he does and it might take us 10 minutes but you know we have that conversation and so it's certainly to have patience and to make sure that you include everyone and not not have an agenda as to how that needs to happen mm -hmm. to really be open and and let that person express to you what they need thank you all for attending today yes thank you so you can you have good positive comments uh thank you everybody for attending so yeah feel free to um to go on your way for the day and have a lovely day and uh we'll kind of hang out here for a little bit <laughs> so Roxanne, can I ask you a question? Yes. Did you ever come across, well, even you, Renee, if one of you can answer, um, did you guys ever come across, um, like, when you're reaching out for advocacy and for advocates and people say they're interested, they want to help, but then all of a sudden they're just like, either in it for their own specific agenda or their own specific, not for everybody's, but their own. Because yeah. um, that's what I, I am seeing. I am kind of going through, there's a very, there's like maybe one or two that I can really count on. Yeah. So, um, especially like Renee is the one that's been helping us so, so much. Thanks, Renee. You got to get an Indian name. <laughs> we got to give you an Indian name. But anyways, um, you know, how can we inspire or motivate these already advocates to um, join the cause and to be more active and to do a lot of follow up or, you know, just to work together? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying a lot, but it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. There sort of has to always be somebody at the top directing stuff, right? And so that's why in the beginning, I kind of said, don't expect anyone to help you. You know, is that lots of people have opinions and lots of people will tell you their stories, but there's always that person at the top that really has got to keep pushing it pushing it forward. And that's hard. Like I know for myself, I'm really tired. I haven't interacted with the spina bifida community a lot in the last maybe seven years. And that clinic needs a, you know, need, I should still be advocating and yet I'm exhausted from the process. And, and so, I don't know, like, it's just you really got to make an effort to understand where people are coming from and maybe why they can't participate fully and creating strategies to include them because you need those stories and you need their support but they may never be the one to carry it forward or to follow through yeah there's like a confidence thing with that as well but i think yeah. one of my i guess my learnings is like i agree with roxanne about like needing somebody to be the person that keeps pushing it forward but i'm also becoming a really strong believer in a, having and cultivating a really tight team around something slowly um, because and, and making sure that I'm doing it with um, a really small team so that there is ownership and buy-in and that they see um, that it's theirs as well and I it's I just find it to be I, I think I find advocacy really frustrating and challenging in some ways because it requires so much cultivation of relationship to be able to move it forward and to have other people willing to help move it forward. Um, and it's so time consuming, but it's so critical because I realize once we have that tight team, it can move forward, but it's, it's, it's embedding that notion of ownership and initiative to help drive it forward too is so hard. And it, I find it's just like directing people, okay, starting to tell them what to do and hopefully they start to pick it up as they go but yeah it's awkward for me because i'm an able-bodied white 
you know, all these things, but I realize somebody has got to be pushing it forward. Well, and it's nerve wracking. So there's also that there's a lot of anxiety that happens. Like when I press that send button, like I did yesterday, I wrote a, a letter to home care and it's like total panic, right? Oh my God, what's going to happen now that I've sent it, you know? And so you have to be prepared for all the emotion that, that goes with it. And, and the anxiety and that, that, you, that the people that you're working with may have levels of anxiety that are different from your own. Um, and, and sometimes that anxiety can be paralyzing in a way. Yeah. Um, so it's really trying to be open and understanding to what people can give of themselves. Okay. I yeah, get yeah. That's huge. It's a, it's a big, big plate to carry. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Long term yeah yeah and i always tell everybody things don't happen overnight you know it could take a year two years three years before real change is seen but a lot of times i see that um the ones that i do talk to they always say oh you know it doesn't happen you know like they don't do anything or um nothing's ever going to be done and to me like i just in my mind i just say be patient be patient don't get mad lenora just be calm <laughs> so i just kind of hold those those that that part of me in yeah sometimes i take it personally and i'm trying not to but yeah it's it's frustrating on both sides you know advocating plus being the um, person that was um, victimized or uh, discriminated against. You know? mm -hmm. I don't want to be a victim. I just, you know, I was a person of, that was discriminated. That's what I would say, but not a victim, never a victim. But yeah, so that's, I know exactly what you're talking about. It is a lot of, lot of frustration on my end, but like I said, things don't happen overnight. I it's see. a lot of it's a lot of commitment on your end too and i think i think a lot of us right now for me and i heard this from one of our youth last week and and maybe this will be to wrap it up but this this frustration um as somebody who's been fighting for human rights for so long and then to see a mass force of people to come out on one issue um when those of us are like we're kind of working on this stuff behind the scenes and and keeping trying to move it forward um, and how you can get a swarm of people all at once and then it's all gone. Um, whereas we're all engaging this on a regular basis and we wish people could commit to being here on a regular basis. And I think that's the challenge that we all have. And, and again, it's like cultivating relationships. And I hope that this, this group and this team is, is exactly what we're trying to do here um, and build those leveraging so that, because I, I know having known Roxanne all these years, I know she's often felt like she works in isolation because maybe there's not a lot of people in Edmonton who have that force like she does. But when we start to connect across our communities with like-minded people, then we have that support. It makes us stronger. It makes us feel like when we are like speaking up in front of other people and being that devil's advocate or whatever it is that you feel stronger when you know there are people that are like-minded there with you, even if they're not there physically, but knowing that you have them there. So I think this space of the advocates coming together is like such a critical piece of that. And I know that I have felt since we've started Stride, I have felt more confident and strong in, in saying what I have to say without feeling crappy that I have to be the person who's always bringing up the crap. But we have to know that that that's a role for all of us and, and keep doing that forward. So well, and I just want to add, Renee, like you just make such a good point about like it's about doing uh, I, sorry, I don't mean to but strengthening your community and and about about being confident, right? Part of that is that I've met thousands of people with disabilities at that point at this point I've been doing this for 20 years and I only art probably started saying I'm an advocate about 10 years ago so it wasn't after 10 years of hearing stories of people um, now what I love about stride is I feel like we're going to get people there a lot quicker right because we're going to connect them and train them and and they're going to have an opportunity you know through stride you have an opportunity to meet other people and that's very important because when you speak on behalf of a community, you want to make sure you're representing them. 
So you want to make sure that you've heard enough stories that the majority of your peers would relate to what you're saying. Mm. Um, and I go off that, like, you know, we, you know, I still, I maintain a huge network of people and, and I'm always running stuff by them to make sure that, is this actually how you feel? Or am I just making this stuff up? Cause I've been doing this way too long. <laughs> So anyway, sorry to kind of interrupt there. I just no. want to add one more thing that you make me think about, Roxanne, and that you have told us before. It's <clears throat> how you, the issue at hand is not only the issue of people with disabilities, because the whole society will be better if the people who are most marginalized, more overseeing in society, um, actually get is in a better place. And so it goes from being the issue of someone else to being our issue and how uh, the holding the issue together, it also allows the person who is carrying on to have a place and people to lean on yes. at certain times. And, and it also helps us think about a strategy, like what's the time for Roxanne to be up front? What's the time for Renee to be up front? What's the time for Angelica to do it? Because we have different effects <laughs> on people. Yeah. And, and it's, it's important to play with that. And, and yes. we know that Roxanne should, it should lead us on that path of understanding like the, the amount of understanding and awareness that we have gained through you and your teachings is amazing and and but there's a time when Brene should go and there's a time when someone else should go and 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 someone else from your community so I, I think that that's really important in building that core group that is really tied in so yeah I just wanted to add that thank you all right. So with that, I know we're, we're over time and I want people to feel like you can get to your day. There's some more chats there. Shafir, for anyone who's interested in elder care and seniors care, I'd like to share a valuable resource. A woman I volunteer with in Edmonton, Carol Wodak, has been advocating for human rights and elder care for many years and distributes a very regular updates on elder care called Care Watch. If you're interested, please message. Yes, please, Shafir. That's awesome. Thank you, because that's a big issue. All right. So with that, that I am gonna, I will, we can officially end the meeting. Um, I'm gonna hit stop recording, but uh, I know for those of you that need to go, feel free to need to go, you need to go. Um, but like, we'll just kind of hang here until everybody kind of dissipates off knowing that I have a meeting at noon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome, Diana. <laughs> Goodbye, Lenore. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And Roxanne, I really learned a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Let's take Rose. Here, Roxanne. Okay, well, I'm going to head out because I have to use the washroom. <laughs> okay, we'll use the washroom. Thank you so much, Rox. And yeah, that was we'll be seeing you tonight, board meeting. Yay. Oh, no, no, next week. That next week? Tonight. Yeah. Oh, it's next week. Never mind. Yeah. I have another board meeting tonight. That's why I know. <laughs> I'll like, call you later. I will <laughs> you about something. Take care, everyone. We'll see you later, Angelica. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave. I'll look forward to meeting you more. Yeah, I, I look forward to it too. Thanks. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. Okay. Awesome. Kyle Woodock. Shall we use watch? Great. Yay. That's okay. a great one. Yeah, but where's I you know yeah, she always does well. <laughs> She's great. Okay, well I'll just uh I'll just keep do this. Do this. I gotta shut all this stuff down.